Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. We're going to get started now. Um, we are kicking off our uh, winter spring section of the, the bioethics seminar series today with uh, Jake Earl. Jake Earl is an adjunct lecturer at Georgetown University and a professional bioethics consultant. He previously completed a postdoctoral fellowship in bioethics at the National Institutes of Health Clinical Center and worked as a clinical ethicist at a comprehensive medical center. He has a PhD in philosophy from Georgetown and his research interests include research ethics and integrity, clinical and public health ethics, and reproductive ethics. Um, and today, he will be speaking about the social value misconception in clinical research. So please join me in welcoming Jake Earl. Thanks, Alan. Can people hear me all right in the room? Awesome. I'm extremely grateful to have been invited to this seminar. I really admire the work that gets done at Hopkins, both the like life-saving stuff and yada, yada, but the, the bioethics work is really, really good. And I'm a big fan. So I couldn't think of an audience I would rather underwhelm than this one. I'm kidding. I could think of others. Uh, so I'm going to explain what this means in a while. I want to spread the blame a little bit. So I have two co-authors with this work. Liza Dawson at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, where she's the chief of bioethics. Liza's contributed just a wealth of bioethics knowledge. She's been in the field, I think, longer than I've been alive and knows just a lot about some of the types of research that we're discussing and the bioethics issues involved. And then Annette Ridd, who's faculty at the NIH, who has written extensively about social value and ethical implications of thinking about the social value of research, health research generally. They've been a huge uh, asset in this project. And really, it's a it's a joint project. So if you have any objections, um, I'll call them and let them handle it. I want to make a disclaimer that this work was supported when I was working at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research as a bioethicist, um, but it doesn't reflect any of their views. And I don't even know that they knew that I was doing it. So don't hold it against them. I'll start with just the big ideas, as, as big as ideas as you're going to get from this talk. Here, here are the three big ideas. The first is that certain ethical problems can arise when participants in clinical research uh, misconceive the expected social value of, of studies that they're considering participating in uh, or are already participating in. The second big idea is that there's some evidence, I'll qualify what kind of evidence there is, that these ethical problems occur in multiple types of clinical research studies. And the final big idea is that bioethicists need to start working on this. They should improve our understanding of this, of this phenomenon and uh, the ethical problems so that they can be effectively addressed, whatever that might look like. And I'll comment on that a little bit. I want to get into the content here by telling a story. So this, this is Alan, and this is Alan's hematologist, whom I've not named Dr. Hematologist, we can call him. So Alan is in his late 60s. He is was diagnosed with a somewhat rare but not totally rare form of leukemia. Um, he has a limited prognosis um, unless treatment is, is really, really effective and it tends not to be in, in high burden. So Alan understands he probably has a few years left uh, to live even, even with treatment. His hematologist invites him to enroll in a study that is looking at whether for people with certain types of biomarkers who have his type of leukemia, whether beginning treatment when symptoms arise as is current practice um, is adequate or whether it's worthwhile to begin treatment well before symptoms begin. Um, and so there's going to be a knock to quality of life because the type of therapy involved chemotherapy is, is very damaging to quality of life. Um, but if it extends survival, it might be worth, worth doing. And it's currently unknown whether starting therapy when symptoms onset or before onset of symptoms results in better net outcomes for folks. So he's been invited to participate in a study. He understands that he's, he's not going to benefit either way. Um, he's fr from the results, he'll be, he'll be dead before the results are, are in, uh, before they're disseminated. But he has a few concerns that lead him to want to participate in this study. One, he's just generally interested in clinical research and science. He's a, he's a curious guy. He always has been. He also likes his doctor. He wants to please him. And he thinks that enrolling in the trial after being invited will, will do that. His most important motivation though, is that he 
thinks that participating in this trial, contributing his data to this study will benefit other patients like him in the future. The results would be fairly immediately applicable. So unlike say developing a, a vaccine, which still needs to be uh, vetted and produced and, and through regulation, this would result in new clinical guidelines that practitioners could use immediately, would know which is better to start treatment immediately or wait until symptoms onset. So he decides to enroll in the trial. Um, he undergoes some, some testing. And then pretty early on, several, several months in, before, as far as he's aware, he's even been allocated to one arm or the other, he learns that the trial has stopped accumulating participants af after him, uh, which is difficult to hear because he knows that they've recruited about 80 or so people when they need to recruit 1,000 patients in order for the data to be valid and reliable. Otherwise, you really can't infer anything from the outcomes of just 80 people. For the study to be adequately powered, they need roughly 1,000 patients. They've stopped recruiting. He waits several months. He sees that there's been no more recruiting. Eventually, he concludes that the study has been effectively, if not officially, terminated. They will not be accruing more participants, and the study will not generate any valuable data. Alan's really disappointed by this. After all, the reason that he wanted to participate, the reason that he undertook some, some minor risks and, and some real burdens and use of his limited time was that he wanted to be part of something that would benefit people. And it didn't happen. So those are the core details of Alan's story. Um, I think Alan has suffered a, a bad outcome. We'll talk a bit more about what that bad outcome is and whether we sh should be concerned about this type of outcome happening to other research participants. Um, he's gotten something wrong. He misunderstood something, misunderstood some possible consequence of his being involved in research. And there are other examples of this that are fairly familiar. Um, I lost an image, oh no. So uh, the therapeutic misconception, you've heard about this. Um, it was initially discovered by Paul Applebaum and colleagues back in the early 1980s, talking to patients in this, in this case, it was a psychiatric uh, drug trial um, or psych psychi psychiatric treatment trial. And several patients reported that they were happy to be in the trial because uh, the trial was designed to, to benefit them. It was to maximize the effectiveness of therapy for them. And as Applebaum and colleagues got to talking to them, they realized that these patients had a grievous misunderstanding of the study that they were participating in. Many of them seemed to think it was for their benefit. If not primarily, then, then wink, wink, you know, this is definitely the best option for you. I'm your doctor recommending this. They dubbed this the therapeutic misconception. Uh, further research found that this type of misunderstanding about this essential element in clinical research, that it is not primarily for the benefit of the patients involved, that is primarily to collect data that will be useful for other people in the future. Um, they found that this occurs in a range of types of study uh, in oncology and in infectious disease research, um, and that it can be fairly recalcitrant. Even if you try to correct people or to prevent it, uh, it you can often fail to do that. So people who are susceptible to this type of misconception are resiliently susceptible to it. We're aware of the therapeutic misconception. There's a lot of debate about it. What does it mean? What does it mean to have the misconception? Is it is it enough that you think that you're going to benefit from being in a trial, or do you have to think that the trial was designed to benefit you? Is any type of severe misunderstanding about the organization or purposes of a trial enough to count as a therapeutic misconception? Um, or, or do you need something something less than that? I don't want to wade into those debates, but this is the this is the general idea. A similar phenomenon has been documented in trials that aim not to treat an illness, an existing illness, but that aim to prevent an illness from occurring. This has been called the preventive misconception. It's been documented in certain uh, vaccine trials to protect against infectious diseases, to assess whether a new vaccine is effective against infectious diseases. Participants will receive a vaccine. Some percentage of them come to believe that they've effectively been protected from the illness, and then they might go on to behave in ways that will put them at risk. Um, it's been documented in a shingles vaccine. I don't know what puts you at risk of shingles. I don't know if there's any substantial risk involved there, um, but it's also occurred in HIV vaccine uh, studies, which could be pretty dire. If you believe that you've been effectively vaccinated against HIV when you've received a study vaccine, which, which might not have any real 
meaningful expectation of efficacy, uh, you might make decisions that end up hurting you. Um, at the very least, you can make decisions that will not be in line with your own values and preferences. This could be after you've received the study vaccine or when you're considering enrollment. Um, if someone says to you, I want you to enroll in a vaccine study for HIV, and you believe, oh, I would love to be protected from HIV. I'm at high risk of that. It's a big deal in my life. Um, and that's not correct that you're going to be given any meaningful protection. Um, you've made a bad decision uh, that doesn't align with your values and preferences for how you live your life. Um, so this is another type of way in which participants misconceive something or severely misunderstand something about a trial or study that they've been invited to participate in. I wanna categorize these under a broad heading of something called participant misconceptions. Um, and so this is me weighing in on the debate about what exactly the therapeutic misconception is. I wanna take just a broad view um, that the therapeutic misconception and the preventive misconception are tokens of this broader type. Um, when you have a misconception in this sense, you have a complex of false beliefs um, about a study regarding either the study's nature, its purpose, or outcomes you could reasonably expect um, either from the study as a whole or from your participation in it. Um, having a participant misconception uh, as, as defined here can be ethically concerning. Um, it's not necessarily ethically concerning or ethically problematic, um, but it can be concerning when it undermines good decision-making about research participation, either at enrollment or in continuing in a study. Um, if you misconceive some essential aspect of a study, its nature, its purpose, or its reasonably expected outcomes, you might make decisions that are at odds with your deeply held values and preferences. You could also fail to protect yourself from harm when making decisions about study participation. I wanna emphasize that participant misconceptions are not necessarily ethically problematic. So let's say that you have been offered to participate in a study of a new statin drug. And for whatever reason, you believe that the statin drug is a me too. It's just a copy of an existing drug. And so you think there's no real scientific or potential medical benefit from either participating in the study or for, for other people who, who might use this statin later. Um, that's false. Uh, that might be a misconception of a certain kind, um, but it's not ethically problematic if the only reason you're enrolling in the study is to make money. If your only concern is I wanna be compensated from participating in this study, uh, then it doesn't matter that you've misconceived some essential aspect um, because it doesn't interact in a negative way with your values and preferences, and it's not going to lead to you having worse well-being than you otherwise would. So not all participant misconceptions are ethically concerning, but they can be, um, and we might expect there to be some type of risk. So obviously, Alan is suffering from some type of participant misconception. He thought that the study would have a certain type of outcome. It didn't. And he's disappointed um, and thinks, I, I would have rather not enrolled. I would have spent my time doing something else. So the title of this talk is, is the social value misconception. So I'm going to say that there's a particular type of misconception about social value. What do I mean by social value? Um, I'm going to adopt Annette Ridge definition here, which I think she does a nice job glossing from the literature. So social value refers to the likelihood that clinical research will produce data that are useful for protecting or promoting the health of current or future members of society. Um, and here, when I talk about what helps, it's it's the results. It's the information uh, generated by research. Some people talk about social value in terms of particular products, say therapeutics or, or preventive interventions or, or public health interventions, whatever it is. Um, but I'm following Jonathan mm -hmm. Kimmelman and thinking that's really the value of the information that, that matters for the research. Um, and then just to clarify that here, I'll, I'll sometimes talk about expected social value. We could think about social value of research retrospectively. So how, how valuable was a study that occurred in the past, given everything that uh, was, was subsequent to it. Um, but what matters here when thinking about decision-making about research participation is the expected or ex-ante social value. Um, what will the social value be? And, and knowing that there's um, it, it's predictive and uncertain. So we can decompose social value into two components, somewhat like risk. So uh, the likelihood that some type of outcome will result, and then uh, the, the goodness or, or the magnitude of value or distribution of value of that outcome. So um, this is also taken from uh, Annette Ridd and Meta Rostenberg's uh, 2020 paper, um, where they identify different ways in which um, studies can have or lack 
expected social value. Um, over in the likelihood column over there, um, you'll see that these are features that are often described as, as scientific validity or scientific value. Um, these are factors about how the research is organized, planned, conducted, executed, how the results are used um, that can impact social value. Um, so for instance, if you're thinking about a vaccine study, um, if your study is uh, designed in a way that is collecting valid data, if you have a good plan to disseminate to relevant stakeholders in uh, vaccine production and distribution, then your study is going to be more likely to be valuable. Um, regardless, and we can we can think separately about what type of condition the, the vaccine is for, right? It might be for the common cold, or it might be for a much more serious condition like, like HIV. Um, the magnitude of the health value has to do with things like how harmful is the condition? How beneficial would potential interventions made on the basis of the information produced from the study be? Um, how many people suffer from the disease? Um, how many would benefit from the information that you produce? Those could be different. Um, and then when thinking about distribution, you might think that um, certain people, because of their overall disadvantage, it's better to promote their health than to, say, promote the health of people who are already relatively advantaged, either absolutely or in terms of their health. Um, I, I'm happy to leave that for discussion. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the social value of research. Um, some things I want to bracket and, and not talk about right now, but maybe we could address in, in Q&A. Um, you might think, well, why should we limit social value or our talk about social value to just health benefits? Um, research can have all sorts of other benefits or health benefits can have secondary, say, economic or cultural benefits or security benefits. You could think of other values that might be promoted by good research rather than just health benefits. Um, bracketing that question, people have asked about when can expected social value justify certain risks? So say you have a relatively high risk of death of your participants in a certain type of study, can social value of a certain amount ever justify that? Or what types of risk can be justified by expected social value? Is there some minimum threshold at which, below which we should not permit studies um, if they don't produce enough social value, whether those are human subjects studies or other types? And then is there some type of duty to maximize social value in research and, and what are the the contours of that duty. So th these are all great questions you can ask about the social value of clinical research. Ask someone else, or I'm kidding, I'll talk about them, but I'm, I'm not, they're not the focus here. Um, the focus here is thinking about how expected social value of research might play into participant decision-making and the ethical responsibilities of people uh, running research in the clinical research enterprise, broadly speaking. What we propose is that there is another type of misconception, what we call the social value misconception. So again, like the other participant misconceptions, it's a complex of false beliefs about the purpose, goals, or reasonably expected outcomes. And what those are here are about a research study's expected social value. How valuable are the results going to be in terms of either the likelihood of uh, the results promoting or protecting the health of others um, or the, the magnitude, the size of the benefit that's going to result? So in Alan's case, it seems like Alan suffers from a misconception about the expected social value of the research. He goes in assuming that the study is going to recruit enough participants to yield valid data that will then affect clinical practice uh, for, the, for the treatment of his leukemia. And in fact, that's not the case. And so he's, he's disappointed. He ends up making a bad decision because he made a false assumption about the likelihood of the research generating valid, useful data. Um, he might have correctly assessed the magnitude of benefit, right? Um, he might understand, okay, this is the impact that it's going to have if clinicians had this type of information at their disposal. Here are the benefits. Um, here are the potential costs involved. So he might have assessed magnitude correctly, but he got the likelihood wrong. So there's something defective about his understanding of the expected social value. Um, something really important to keep in mind is that unlike, say, the therapeutic misconception where presumably everybody cares about promoting their own health. And so if you think a study is going to promote your own health, you might be more inclined to participate in that study, even if that belief is false. Um, the social value misconception applies specifically to people who have altruistic motivations for participating in research. Um, so had Alan not been altruistically motivated, it seems like he there wouldn't be any particular reason to care about whether the study produces socially valuable results or not. Um, so the social value misconception seems to have the possibility of undermining good decision-making in research participants, 
who are altruistically motivated to participate in research, like, like Alan is. So I've been talking uh, as philosophers do in, in generalities, giving you some definitions, giving you a, a, a case, but you could reasonably ask, is this, is this really a thing? He's, he's made up a case, um, you know, maybe this happens, maybe it doesn't. We could make up all types of participant misconceptions. Maybe it's possible that somebody assumes that they're gonna get some great inheritance. Um, they're gonna inherit a haunted house if they participate in a study. Is there then a haunted house inheritance misconception that we should care about as bioethicists? No, obviously. So um, I, I will say at the outset, there's no systematic investigation that's been done to assess how participants in clinical research think about the expected social value of the research and how that might relate to their altruistic motivations, or I haven't been able to find it. My, my co-authors and I have not been able to find that study if it exists. So everything I say is, is conditioned on that. There's been no such study. And the result of such studies could be that this isn't really a thing. However, in the absence of that work being done, I think that there is circumstantial evidence that indicates that we should be worried about the social value misconception in a range of types of research. Um, and I'm going to go through what I think the evidence for that is now, and then at the end, talk about sort of the implications and, and of course, limitations of that evidence. So I, I have to make a confession. Alan's story is not a philosopher's case. I cribbed it from a real thing that happened to a very real bioethicist, uh, Alan Wertheimer. So Alan Wertheimer had this exact experience. Um, he was diagnosed with leukemia. He was not long for the world. Um, his hematologist invited him to participate in a study much like the one I described. He enrolled, and in fact, the study stopped recruiting people shortly after he, after he enrolled and never generated any valuable data. Um, Wertheimer himself says that he would not have participated in the study had he, had he known that there was some substantial risk that they would fail to recruit or, or complete, uh, fa fail to recruit enough participants to complete the study. He, he proposes in, in the paper where he reports this experience that he suffered from what he calls a completion misconception. Um, and that because there's this thing, a, a such thing as a completion misconception, researchers have a duty to inform participants about the risks of study non-completion. Um, one of the goals of this project is to broaden Wertheimer's insight because the worry about completion is not about whether you recruit enough people in the study, that itself doesn't matter. Um, you could say, miss your recruitment target, but still generate valuable information. Uh, the, the worry is about social value. He wanted the research to have a positive impact on the health of others, and it didn't because it had this defect with its uh, recruitment. But there are all sorts of other defects that research can have. Um, and it seems like we shouldn't care less about those or more about completion. Um, so you could think of the completion misconception as a token of, a, of the broader type, which is the social value misconception. Um, so what about this duty to inform? You know, I think, well, well, maybe this is just a fluke, right? Think, things happen, bad things happen. So maybe there wasn't some, some big mistake. Um, you know, it's unfortunate for Wertheimer, but, but there's nothing ethically concerning here. The trouble is that um, non-completion, uh, failure to recruit enough participants happens fairly frequently in clinical research. This 2015 uh, paper from Carlisle and co-authors shows that um, of studies that were formally closed, according to the National Library of Medicine in 2011, 43% um, of them uh, closed due to poor accrual of some kind. Um, and uh, that if you looked at um, how many of those studies either explicitly formally closed because they didn't recruit enough participants, which, which is a pretty small number, usually they close for other reasons, um, or those that recruited too small of a percentage for their results to be adequately powered. So they're not uh, statistically generalizable in the way that the study had planned them to be. Um, that number comes to about 80, 19% of all the studies that closed in, in 2019. There's reason to think that these numbers have improved. Um, the National Cancer Institute has, has implemented reforms to try to improve recruitment. Um, but uh, this was a, in some way, predictable outcome um, of a uh, possible outcome that of which Wert Wertheimer could have been warned. Um, so it makes sense to think there might've been some obligation uh, to, to warn him about it. So that's that's one, one real case. It seems like Alan Wertheimer suffered from a social value misconception and it had a negative impact on his ability to live according to his values and preferences and, and maybe his well-being. Here's another case, again, anecdotal. This is Jeremy Menchik. He's a professor of international relations at Boston University. So back in 2020, he enrolled in Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine study. 
the results came out. He was extremely excited, extremely pleased to be part of this, this first wave of positive results showing the effect of vaccines. Um, so he enrolled in a follow-up trial that was looking at how to, how to boost um, the, the initial vaccine. He ultimately quit on the grounds that Moderna was not doing enough to ensure that its product was available broadly um, to those people in the world who really needed protection from COVID-19. He wrote a resignation letter that was published in STAT. Um, and uh, he, he says, instead of going all out to end the pandemic as quickly as possible, Moderna is helping to prolong it by not making its mRNA technology available to the US government or other manufacturers. So his objection was that Moderna could have taken its technology and licensed it more freely, given it on, on a free basis to other producers, especially in developing countries, so that you could have greater access and greater social benefit to the vaccine. Moderna had failed to do that, um, which was contrary to his expectations. This is what he assumed would happen. And so he was uh, decided to withdraw from the study. He also encouraged other people, other participants to withdraw from the study for the same reason. Um, so this is clear that a uh, sincere belief that he has, uh, he expressed offense and disappointment. Um, it seems like he expected at the outset that participating in the study and that the results of the study would be more beneficial than they in fact were. Now, whether that was a reasonable expectation, who's, who's to say? Um, but I think this is another case where someone came into a trial with expectations about how socially valuable the results were going to be. Those expectations were disappointed. Um, would he have participated if he had known what the outcome would be? It's somewhat unclear, but given, given what he says, given how much he encourages people to drop out of the trial, it seems reasonable to conclude that he would, would have made a different decision. Um, so I think this is another good anecdotal case um, of someone who suffered from the social value misconception in a way that was ethically concerning. So great, I've got you two dudes, two guys uh, suffered, suffered from this. I think there are more general reasons to suspect that this happens more broadly. First, um, lots of people participate in clinical research for at least partially altruistic reasons. Um, this is a report from a survey in 2017, a global survey of thousands of research participants and non-research participants. These are results from research participants when asked, just indicate why, why, do you, why did you participate in clinical research when you did? The first reason you'll see there clocking at 43% of respondents was to help advance science in the treatment of my disease condition. So you could say, well, that's, that's maybe mixed altruism. But even if you assume that's selfish, the second most frequent, 35%, uh, to help others who may suffer from my disease or condition. So these are people who have a medical condition and they participate participate in research related to that, expressing altruistic motivation in 35% of cases. I understand that that might overrepresent. Typically when asked, are you a good person? People say, yes, of course I'm a good person. Um, so there might be some overrepresentation there, but there's other data that, that confirms that people do participate, especially healthy research participants. So this is, does not include healthy research participants. Um, it's hard to imagine in many cases, especially for studies that are not well compensated, why healthy people would participate in clinical research, especially clinical research that involves meaningful risks, unless they had some type of altruistic motivation. This is just to say altruistic motivations are common. So the background is set for potentially ethically concerning social value misconception. In the remaining time, I wanna walk us through three scenarios of types of research in which we should expect that people would suffer from social value misconception in a way that's ethically concerning. Um, let's start with inherently low value research. So here I'm talking about studies that have little to no expected social value due to their objectives, design, implementation, or, or some other aspect. So anyone who has altruistic motivations for participating in such studies are going to be disappointed because they're not generally socially valuable. There are other sorts of concerns about these studies, but this is a new one, right? That there's a concern about the decision-making of participants um, for, for folks who enroll if, if they're altru altruistically motivated. Here's an extreme case. So um, this, is, this has been documented that uh, Merck, when it was studying rofococcib, a uh, trade name Vioxx, which ultimately was pulled because it kills people, um, conducted this study called Advantage, where it was a very strangely structured study. You had clinicians, who were assisting with the study, but they were each tasked to recruit only a, a handful of participants to take rofococcib, and then they were going to track um, gastrointestinal side effects. Uh, what was strange about this is that they recruited hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of clinicians from across the country 
to be part of the study, each recruiting just a small number of participants. Um, and Merck was also running a larger, much more normal looking trial, looking at the same types of uh, information. What are the relationships between gastrointestinal side effects and, and rofococcib? Um, Merck's head of research even called this study uh, scientifically useless. Why did Merck do this? It was designed by marketing executives in the company um, as a seeding trial. The goal is to familiarize clinicians, a, a key influencer group, um, with the drug. So they get familiar with the drug, they understand it, and then they'll encourage their uh, clinician uh, uh, fellows to prescribe the drug. This was the point. This is There's documentation. Someone was nominated for a marketing award for designing the trial. Um, so the study had real no expected social value in terms of health beyond just selling this drug. This is an extreme case. This is fairly infrequent. But in this type of study, anybody who might have participated for altruistic reasons um, was not acting according to uh, in, in a way that would promote their values and preferences. Um, a, a more plausible example are studies that have worthwhile objectives, but there are problems with their design or, or implementation or conduct. So multiple trials of potential COVID-19 therapeutics in the midst of the pandemic suffered from all sorts of organizational problems. Many were underpowered, recruiting fewer than 50, fewer than 100 participants, um, limiting generalizability of the results. They often lack control arms or randomization or blinding or all sorts of other mechanisms to control for bias. Um, they also had inconsistent dosing and outcome measures, which meant that you couldn't pool the results together and say, all right, we, these were conducted in different trials, but let's look at all the results together because you just didn't have the information you needed. Many of these trials were totally pointless. They generated no useful information at all, um, not because they weren't done with good intentions, but because they were executed poorly. So anyone who enrolled in these trials for altruistic reasons or partially altruistic reasons, again, would have suffered from an ethically problematic social value misconception. So that's a really pretty small case. Most clinical research is great, well-conducted, in, in some way valuable. How else can we see the social value misconception? Um, one way is when clinical research is hyped. Does anyone recognize these? Uh, these uh, yeah, the Board Ape NFTs. These were like tokens on the blockchain. They were going to hold value for some reason. And then people realized you can just do screenshots. And, and so there's no way to really keep track. Um, so... The board eight eminent NFT was hyped. So, so in the context of research, hype is public exaggeration of the expected benefits of research. Many areas of clinical research suffer from, from hype for, for all sorts of complicated reasons that other people have documented. Um, genomics research, uh, some people have argued that psychedelics research is now un undergoing its, its hype era. Um, so when studies are hyped, even when they have substantial social value, we could expect participants to have an inflated expectation of what that social value is. So the study is socially valuable, but participants expect it's going to be more socially valuable, which could lead them to make bad decisions with respect to enrollment. Um, here's a case. So you might remember this big pandemic we went through pretty close to the beginning. People started suggesting, what if we did controlled human infection trials? So we take people in a controlled setting, we infect them with COVID-19. We do things to reduce the risk by selecting people and doing it in the right environment. Um, see how the disease works. We can do some initial testing of, say, some, some vaccines, down-select vaccines that seem to be working, and then do shorter, smaller field trials. Um, and this could result in faster vaccine development. This was the argument made by bioethicists, made by scientists, uh, including many Nobel laureates. Government officials weighed in saying, yes, we, we should do this. The argument being that we could do it at a minimal enough risk and that it could save thousands, hundreds of thousands. Some claimed it could save even millions of lives by speeding vaccine development. As a result, unsurprisingly, people got really excited about this. Tens of thousands of people volunteered, not, not that they volunteered for the studies. The first study wasn't initiated until late 2021 and is small, um, but they volunteered to like be on a list. If, if you run one of these studies, I wanna be part of it. Um, I wanna help save the world and speed up vaccine development by getting infected with COVID. It got all sorts of coverage. Um, at the same time, uh, there was not expert consensus on this. There were questions about the ethical acceptability of imposing this type of risk on research participants. Um, but more importantly, there were major doubts, major holes in the theory that conducting this type of research would have substantial social value, let alone social value that led to like saving millions of lives. Um, multiple groups pushed back and said, look, the only way to conduct these studies is if you could be sure that there's enough social value, enough expected social value. 
Um, and there are all sorts of reasons to doubt that. Deming et al., uh, these are researchers who are experienced with challenge studies, said, noted at the time, uh, what I think is really profound, large randomized controlled trials of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines are currently the most efficient, generalizable, and scientifically robust path to establishing vaccine efficacy. It turned out they were right. We did establish effective vaccines by conducting large, expensive trials in the field. Um, and so the promise that conducting in 2020 controlled human infection studies would have led to faster approval was probably false. It probably would not have led to faster approval for, for a number of reasons. Um, I think this is a case where we saw people suffering from potential research participants suffering from a misconception about the expected social value of research. One day sooner, an organization that led um, many, many of these efforts, and I, I do want to note, revised their claims at, as evidence developed. Um, they're excellent people one day sooner. I, I know them. Um, their heart was in the right place. Um, but on their website, in the midst of this discussion, they said developing a vaccine one day sooner, that's how they got the organization's name, could avert tens of thousands of deaths, when that likely wasn't true. Or challenge studies would not result in that outcome. Um, when they surveyed volunteers, something like 95% of them said that they wanted to advance science and save human lives, whereas it's not clear that participating in a challenge study would have saved any lives at all. So this, I think, is an example where hype, exaggeration about the potential benefits of research can lead to ethically concerning social value misconception in research participants. Okay, final scenario that I want to discuss with you is ordinary clinical research. So this is just most, most clinical research. It usually has substantial expected social value, and there's not any type of special hype about it. An ordinary person is not going to have an inflated expectation of how beneficial this is going to be. Um, nonetheless, social value misconception can raise ethical concerns precisely because people have limited understanding of important aspects of science, namely its inherent uncertainty and incrementality and certain organizational challenges that prevent the optimization of social value within science. Um, man, my images are not cooperating today. So HIV cure related studies, um, this is a major area of research that you've probably heard about. The goal is to either clear the virus from someone who is has an established infection or to allow the virus to be controlled sufficiently without active antiretroviral therapy. So without taking pills every day or even necessarily getting like a long lasting um, antiretroviral injection. Um, these studies typically involve no expectation of clinical benefit for people who participate and especially for people with HIV who enroll. Um, they sometimes face some risks, such as if there's an analytical treatment interruption in which they stop their treatment to allow their virus to rebound to see if a study intervention modulates the way that their virus behaves in some, in some expected way. Um, at the same time, people who participate in HIV cure related research are generally motivated by altruism. Um, they want to benefit other people uh, like themselves many of them presumably knowing that they themselves might not benefit from the cure, um, given the establishment of their infection and, and the different modalities in which HIV research might be cured. So why do I think that there might be social value misconception in these studies? Lillian Lau and colleagues um, back in 2020 surveyed people in Australia living with HIV, some a small number of whom had participated in HIV cure related research, and HIV specialized healthcare providers. And among the many questions they asked them about their, their views about this type of research, they said, do you believe an HIV cure is available within the next 10 years? A whopping 55% of the non-clinical expert people living with HIV said, yes, a cure is achievable within the next 10 years. Um, whereas only 19% of HIV specialized providers uh, agreed with that. This is a wild overestimation. Um, by, by any reasonable judgment, 55% of people thinking that an HIV cure is available within 10 years. Um, an expert group was looking at the product development pipeline, um, and, and what they say is, is probably an understatement. The timing for introduction of HIV cure strategies under investigation currently and on aspirational HIV cure strategy is unknown. We have no idea when in the future. We expect long-lasting stuff within the next few years, but something that looks anything like a cure, the timeline is entirely unknown. Um, other reports from around this time indicate that within the next 10 years, a lot will be learned. There will be socially valuable information gained about potential HIV cure strategies, but having a cure ready to deploy in 10 years is entirely unrealistic. Um, I think that we should expect this type of overestimation of the social value of clinical research in all sorts of areas of research for, for a few reasons. So first of all, people just don't understand that, uh, it, or, ordinary people don't understand that science is extremely uncertain and advances incrementally. 
Um, you can see this uncertainty by comparing the last few decades, major advances in the effectiveness of cancer therapeutics, um, but despite similar large investments, um, almost no advances in terms of meaningful product outcomes um, in HIV vaccines. We're nowhere closer, we're, we're closer to an HIV vaccine, but we don't have one. Whereas cancer therapeutics have become much, much more effective. 14% um, of interventions tested in phase one studies uh, ultimately get approved, um, but a survey uh, conducted in 2017 showed that 40% of just the general US public um, believes that developing a new drug takes, takes five years total, whereas it takes more than 10 um, just from the point at which you start human trials. Um, so people are underestimating how long it takes and how uncertain it is to develop some type of intervention that's going to be beneficial. Um, and I posit that this would trickle down into their assessments of the expected social value of any particular study. Similarly, people are often ignorant of the particular organizational challenges that come with optimizing the expected social value of research, um, that administration and, and other uh, constraints limit research or productivity. Um, we allocate institutional resources inefficiently and fail to prioritize um, the, the most socially valuable research in our funding. Um, I'll go through this later, but uh, basically Joe Millam and Leah Pearson looked at the top 10 funders of health research internationally and found that uh, none of them explicitly instruct their reviewers for funding to take into account things like prevalent severity um, or urgency of the conditions they're studying. And this is all against the backdrop of people just having fairly limited understanding of science generally. Uh, this Gallup Welcome Poll um, from uh, published in 2019 asked, how much do you personally know about science? Do you know a lot, some, not much, or nothing at all? 57% of people globally said that they know not much or nothing at all. Um, that can be much higher in some regions of the world. Now you might be heartened, you might think, oh, well, North America, yeah, it's something like 77% uh, of people say that they know some about science. A different survey conducted by Pew found that 50% of Americans could not successfully identify scientific hypothesis. So we're good at saying we know things. It's not clear that we actually do know things. You might ask here, well, wait, if, if people don't know about science, doesn't that mean they're less likely to participate in research or be involved in science? Not necessarily. Again, we don't have systematic data. No one's asked research participants about this. But um, in a follow-up analysis, uh, a quarter to a third of people who report, self-report, that they know not much or nothing at all about science say that they trust science a lot, um, maybe trust them enough to agree to participate in a study. Alan's case is instructive. Alan Wertheimer was a brilliant guy. He had written uh, multiple books. He published groundbreaking work on the ethics of research with human subjects. He still made a mistake um, because he didn't have the right information. Um, so if Alan could make this mistake, what hope do ordinary people have? So if I review these three scenarios, again, this is circumstantial evidence um, that the conditions are right for something like ethically concerning social value misconception. So, so the question is, is this a thing? Um, I, I think there's reason to suspect that it is a, is a thing. So I, I know we're close to time. So I'm going to run through the rest quickly. Here, here's what I think we should do as a community of bioethicists. Um, I think we need to empirically investigate this, figure out, start asking participants, uh, why are you participating in the study? How valuable you think the study is going to be for other people? As far as I know, no one's asked that in a systematic way. Um, from that, we can figure out, are there certain types of research, certain types of population in which the social value misconception occurs? Again, it might, it might, not, it might not occur. I might be wrong. I'll allow for that. Um, there are all sorts of challenges with, with conducting this research. In addition to empirical study, I, I think we need more normative reflection and investigation. Um, is there some threshold at which someone can mistake some aspects of expected social value, but still permissibly and acceptably enroll, even though they have false beliefs? Um, might there be trade-offs between different misconceptions and how we handle them? Um, one of the things that people have done to uh, address the therapeutic misconception is to emphasize in informed consent documents that this study is not to benefit you, it's to benefit other people. Are we encouraging one type of misconception by trying to combat another? It's a question. I don't know. Um, mitigation approaches, if, if they're found to be necessary, I think could take two forms and, and could coexist. One is trying to alter people's beliefs and expectations about the social value of research. The other is to change the social value of research to better match people's beliefs and expectations. Um, inherently low value clinical research, I think our work just supports the suggestion that others have made that we need better mechanisms to prevent this type of research from happening in the first place. 
Um, we just thrown in another reason. Hyped clinical research, that's tough. How do we educate the public, make them more aware? Um, I think a recommendation for ordinary clinical research is to end for, that would help address issues with hyped research is to implement reforms that have been suggested by multiple people to improve the expected social value of clinical research across the board, um, which would mean that expectations would align more closely um, with reality. So again, these are the big ideas that I think I've delivered on. Ethical problems can arise when participants in clinical research misconceive in the sense I've defined the expected social value of studies that they might participate in. Um, there is some evidence, circumstantial, that these problems occur in multiple areas of clinical research and bioethicists need to investigate more to figure out whether and how to mitigate these concerns. Thanks for listening. I look forward to your questions. We have uh, 10 minutes each. Uh, thanks. I was super I'm really interested in what you talked. Um, so I want to, um, in my mind, distinguish some of the reasons that lead to a bucket of things, all of which you're calling a misconception. And in my mind, unlike like when when Apple Bombell deployed therapeutic deception, I, I I think they were saying, we told you information, you know, told you well, kind of told you, we told you information and you got to be wrong. There was a misunderstanding, which in my mind is parallel to one of your what I thought were four uh scenarios where there might be what you call a misconception. Like I don't know, I tell you I'm in the registry and you somehow conclude I'm being up with your cancer. It's like, oh that was a misunderstanding. Which strikes me as potentially different from either where I deceive you where someone purposely puts out information or there's just been terrible rigor like you know what Janet Woodcock has sort of been calling small crappy trials. Like they, they never should have been approved in the first place. Why are they calling that a misconception on the participants um, part? Or or ultimately like it's like the hypothesis, you know, I thought that X was going to be sufficient power and it turned out it wasn't. And is that a misconception on your part that Everybody in the scientific community thought that this was going to be a trial with value. So, so I guess I wanted to distinguish misconception, which in my mind puts the onus on the participant, from other situations that may result in understanding that turned out to not be true, but where it was somebody else who screwed up. And, you know, again, I mean, not to be silly here, but if I say to you, you know, in an hour, I'll walk to the other building with you. And the whole time, I never, I said, ha, 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 I'm going to jump in and go somewhere else. Do we call that a misconception on your part that you thought I was going to walk with you? So I'm, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. Um, and I think you're right that in terms of the way that we use the term misconception or, or misunderstanding, right, it tends to have something to do with follow-up on communication, sure. right, rather than someone showing up. And although I, I think people can misconceive something in the sense that they show up with expectations that maybe aren't corrected, that should have been corrected. Um, what, I, what I think is relevantly similar, and, and really the argument is, is just that if we're concerned about therapeutic misconception, as I'm talking about it here, or preventive misconception, I think we should also be concerned about this other thing that is similar in, in relevant ways, um, is that we, we do talk about the social value of research to study participants. Um, we don't use that language but we do say in consent forms, and I think more importantly, and in a less well-documented way, in consent conversations, the point of this is to, our goal here, what we hope, what will result is this. And then we paint them a picture of the great things that are going to happen from this study. And then of course, people's imaginations and, and their, their background information interpret that um, to mean this is going to do some good in the world. Um, and I think that Unfortunately, we don't say enough. And the question is, what, what should we say um, to give people accurate information about, about what, they, what they could expect? Um, Wertheimer said, you know, he, he expected a warning. He should have been warned that there was some chance 
that the study would just fail to recruit enough people to have been worth doing at all. Because he, he just assumed that if a study had been approved by an IRB and was being conducted by these well-respected scientists, that of course they were going to figure out, figure that out. They, they were never going to start a study that had no reasonable chance of recruiting enough participants. But in fact, I, I, I think he, he implies that there was never a reasonable chance of doing that. Um, so I, I think we do communicate with people, or I think clinical researchers do communicate with people about expected social value in a way that I think makes misconception in, in your sense, right? We, I've communicated with you and you've misunderstood something a, appropriate as a, as a term. Thank you, Jake. Um, several questions in prior research, two. One is, if we bought in that this is a concern, I'd like to hear you talk more about like, the types of trials for which you'd say it would be more concerning. I mean, I certainly would presume like risk and burden would be up there, concerned about, you know, likening the offsetting the successful trial of other trials, but what am I missing? But presumably there's more. And the other love, I mean, from sitting on DSMBs for which, you know, we start to have that anxiety about like, is this trial going to get through it successfully? If it's the type of trial where participants are coming back and like, for multiple visits, what obligation, if any, do we have to have to the participants, you know, we'll update them about, you know, about this new drug risk, we want you to assess, you know, whether or not you still want to participate. Do we need to start telling them like, likely this trial is not actually going to complete, do you want to keep coming through additional visits? So, to that second question, yeah, totally, right? It's it's a waste of their time. Um, it's disrespectful, especially if we've gotten to the point where we know that the trial is not going to complete. Um, there are questions about can we know ex ante whether a study is going to complete, and and that that is that is more complicated. Um, but I think out of respect for people's time and in in case depending on the interventions that they're undergoing, um, their actual well being, we yeah we should we should tell them that just like we would update them if um, you know something else happens, say, uh, the regulatory pathway were closed for some political reason. Well, now there's no point in completing the study, our funding has been pulled, what have you. Um, I think the types of studies that we're most worried about are those involving either healthy participants or participants with a condition that is under study, but not, uh, th there's not like a, a treatment that's being investigated that, that might work within the context of the trial. Um, and so challenge studies are a great example, right? There's meaningful risks, no expected, uh, clinical benefit to participants. Um, similarly for much HIV cure research, um, but really healthy research, especially the more invasive it is, the more, the more risky it is. I think there's also concern about socially sensitive research. Um, so a, a follow-up paper that I'm working on and I've presented on once is thinking about um, whether this occurs in global health research. So you'll notice these examples are like mostly high, high tech, high technology studies. Um, but increasingly that type of work is being done in other cultural contexts where issues like providing samples or letting, giving people information about your day-to-day -day activities um, is culturally sensitive in ways um, that it might not be say in, in the yeah. West. Um, and so I think to, I think it's important to think about reputational concerns and the integrity of the clinical research enterprise to even think about social value misconception in studies that don't involve, say, major um, major risks of harm to participants. Um, if we're asking people to disclose private information, if we're asking them to make themselves vulnerable to um, to researchers, um, it's got to be Im important that they have an accurate understanding of why they're doing this and how it's valuable. Um, I also think it's uh, crummy to take advantage of people who are trying to do good. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's a principle or not. Thank you, um, Your Honor, for full disclosure. I'm a pediatric oncologist. I have kids on trials all the time. And I do speak to them transparently about, I hope that this is going to help you. But the goal of research is not to help you, right? It's to help the kid come 10 or 15 years down the road. I struggle with what I consider that to be a little bit of arm twisting. For all the reasons you mentioned that one, he wanted to please his doctor. Thought that maybe that'd be better. And 
oh, you benefited from the research of the kids who came before you, kind of the McCormick argument of you have a moral obligation to the research. So I'm curious, what do you think about that discussion that happens between the clinician investigator and the patient or the surrogate of the patient in is that is that appropriate and, and how does one balance that tension because we need to be we need to tell folks but on the other hand that, that, that's not a, that's not fun i think there are a lot of challenges here um one one challenge is that it's often difficult especially for an individual investigator to know well how, how do i talk in a meaningfully responsible way about how the results of this research could benefit other people, right? So we we revert to generalities, and people will fill in their background information. Um, I, I think it's a genuine it's a genuine challenge, right? We uh, as bioethicists are struggling with thinking about how do we um, think about prioritization of research, right? We have limited funds. How do we prioritize? That requires figuring out expected social value um, of entire research programs. How do we then get down to the level of the participant and talk to them meaningfully about what will and won't happen for other people as, as a result of your involvement with this study, or even just from this study as a whole. So then you're helping this thing that's beneficial in this way. It's really tough. And I think one of the objections that's been raised, and I don't know that I have a satisfying answer, is that if we start listing to people, here are all the reasons why this study might not be beneficial, right? Um, we're not great at uh, sharing our data with with clinicians clinicians don't like what we're doing it's unpopular for this or that reason um you know all all the various things that can diminish the expected social value of a study are people going to want to enroll in research um, if they don't perceive some type of personal benefit um, are we going to lose altruistic participation or diminish altruistic participation um i i see the i see the force of that objection at the same time I think people should be making decisions, should be allowed to be making decisions on the basis of good information. Um, yeah, so this is just to acknowledge, I, I think it's I think it's really tough, but just as we're gonna talk to people carefully about um, what are the risks and benefits for you of this research, I think we need to talk to people carefully about, well, what are the benefits for other people if we have some sense that they are altruistically motivated? Let me see, quick question. Hi, I'm Julie Bullen here. I come from the genetics world where things have been hyped and everything's going to be solved once we can uh, understand the whole genome, which is, you know, there's a struggling. But I also am coming thinking of my role in IRB. And like a lot of this problems I'm feeling are also sort of a study of approval issue, and that there's obviously fallen down on putting some form of design, especially when we think about the the low healthy volunteer, low risk. And I, I sit on IRBX here, which is sort of the minimal risk. And I just know from my mouth, Hopkins obviously is this very, very no better IRB, but we, we look at all of these things very heavily, knowing that people are assuming their time, their contribution to the point of how we can approve a flyer. Is it too promising? Is it too, you know, are we going to even get any benefit from that? I mean, something that I think that a lot of this is falling down on the improvement practice that I've mentioned before. And also the challenge of other related work, the challenge of people don't understand how science is done, which is a huge, huge bigger problem. So two tackling um, issues that I think need to be met to fix this. But I also want to just ask what is the difference because if you could say you're in a drug trial that people understand is high risk of cancer, some of those drugs don't work. So that's almost like it didn't help anybody else. I mean, I think how we have to phrase it is like, we, this trial is hopefully helping other people like you. We may learn something. We may not. This may be the drug. This may not. We might not get evidence we need here. We may not. This is a step in this kind of process. I'm just worried that it's almost like not a thesis now, but we don't know if this is going to work. This is assuming the trial works. It's assuming we get data that's meaningful, either positive or negative. Yeah. Yes. So, so two brief responses, because I think you had, you had two points here. I think I think the the first point you made about sort of thinking about low risk, e even low low burden research, and Stephanie, I think this goes to, to your question. Um, one of Wertheimer's reasons for participating, and some of the reasons I participate in research is I'm just curious, right? I, like I'm, it's cool to be around science sometimes. Um, it's cool to say that you participate in a study. Um, I think that could be enough motivation, and it's not really altruistic. Um, so even if we can, even if we have to tell people, look, this is probably not going to benefit anyone. It's like a 
student project or a project that's not going anywhere, um, you could help that student or you could help, you know, just have an interesting time. I think that's acceptable as, as a response, especially for low burden stuff. Um, I forgot the second question. I'm so sorry. No, I was just talking about when we, when we, Oh, about, about particular drugs, right? I think this is part of the reason why it's important to think about the, the value of the results of the research as the information, right? So what we learn is that this drug doesn't work or this class of drugs doesn't work in this type of cancer in this type of patient. Um, London and Kimmelman have a great paper thinking about drug portfolios, right? So it's not whether any particular drug works, it's whether we're learning and moving through the portfolio efficiently to eliminate what doesn't work. Um, I, I think an interesting empirical question is to think about how do how do participants in these studies think about that? Are they focused on the drug or are, are they able to get the idea, okay, well, it's it's the information that we need and the information might just be that, that you helped us get was that this drug was never gonna work. All right, so that's the time we have for today. Our next seminar is February 12th, back here with Jenny Reardon. Uh, and join me in thanking Jake again.